Bridge to Terabithia is a 2007 fantasy drama distributed by Walt Disney. It was directed by Gabor Chupo in his directorial debut. A man who got his start as one of the original animators for The Simpsons and, fun fact, is credited for co-conceiving the idea to give The Simpsons yellow skin. After working as the supervising animation director on The Simpsons for its first three seasons, Chupo would go on to create and produce many iconic cartoons of the 90s and 2000s, including Rugrats, The Wild Thornberries, and As Told by Ginger. Over the course of his career, which has now spanned several decades, he would only take up the role of director for a few movies, the first being Bridge to Terabithia. Bridge to Terabithia is based off of a novel of the same name, and the man whose real-life experiences became the inspiration for the original novel actually wrote the screenplay of the 2007 film. His name was David L. Patterson, and his mother, who wrote the original book, was Catherine Patterson. Because of Bridge to Terabithia's subject matter and the way its themes are conveyed, I would say it's gone down in cinema's canon as one of the saddest movies of all time, and arguably the saddest movie ever distributed by Walt Disney Pictures. I watched the film twice recently in preparation for this review, and each viewing cried several times. It's a very intense watch, and it's at this point I should probably issue a slight trigger warning. For this review, I will be discussing some very serious topics, mainly child abuse, as well as death and grief in the context of childhood experience. It really won't be that intense. After all, this is a PG-rated, quote, kids film, but nonetheless, you have been warned. It's going to get a little real this time around, especially for what seems like, and was certainly advertised to be, a lighthearted, family-friendly fantasy adventure. So the movie opens on a pretty rough note. What I mean by that is, it does not put its best foot forward. The opening scene of Terabithia is an awkward, cluttered montage of animated drawings, over-the-top effects, and footage of our main character Jess running outside in the rain. I understand, like any other film, they needed to open with some excitement, and nothing exciting happens in the beginning of this story. So they just give us this montage to characterize the protagonist and catch the viewer's attention. Unfortunately for me, it had me immediately rolling my eyes. It's just very cheesy and over the top. I'll speak on this more later in this review, but the montages are easily the worst aspect of this film. They just don't work. The cheesy over the top aesthetic of these montages takes the viewer out of an otherwise well conceived realistic drama. That's right, I said realistic. Sounds pretty contradicting since this appears to be a fantasy adventure film, right? Well, it's not because the latter just really isn't a fair assessment of what Bridge to Terabithia is. It's not a film about adventure, or about literally escaping the confines of reality into a magical world. It's about pretending to do those things, as a means of desperate escapism to cope with childhood trauma. The scenes portraying computer-generated magical creatures are few and far between, despite what the trailers for this movie would have you believe, and none of the magic is real. It's all imagined by our characters. More on all of that later. Let's just start with breaking down the plot. So after the initial montage, which seems to tell us the protagonist is an artistically inclined middle schooler named Jess, we are dropped into the morning time routine of Jess's family. And holy shit, this movie does an utterly fantastic job at show don't tell. We get so much insight into the dynamic of this family in just one brief scene. We see that Jess, being the only boy out of five kids, is the black sheep of the family. He's stressed out by his older sister's constant fighting and receives secondary trauma on a daily basis by observing the constant despair and stress his parents are undergoing with trying to raise five kids in the face of financial struggles. We directly see how Jess's less unfortunate financial standing makes him an easy target for the many bullies that inhabit his school. We see how Jess is treated much differently by his father because of a traditional American gender roles which further affirms Jess's role as the black sheep, and is our first example of the straight-up abuse he suffers on a daily basis, that being emotional withholding. All of this is conveyed in the film's first scenes and is further elaborated on as the story continues. We follow Jess throughout a typical school day of being bullied and keeping quiet to himself, until the routine is broken by the introduction of a new transfer student, Leslie. Alright, we gotta talk about the costume design of this film. I mean, it's maybe the most impressive aspect of a film with many impressive features. The costume design is nothing short of masterful, and had it not been, it would have been incredibly detrimental to the film otherwise. 
When you have a movie mainly about kids, if those kids do not seem real in the slightest, it will begin to pull the thread at the illusion the world has created, and the entire edifice will come toppling down. Kids need to be realistically portrayed, or the entire conceit of the film will be ineffective. The costume design of Bridge to Terabithia is absolutely perfect. Leslie is immediately characterized so strongly before we even see her speak or do anything, simply by the immense detail and realism of her outfit. And it's this realism in particular that I greatly admire. In any other film, the kids would be caricatures and would all look totally different. For example, the female bully Janice actually wears similar alternative styled attire to that of Leslie, showing that they have similar interests and also humanizing one of the movie's villains. In any other film, Janice would be seen in very preppy, gaudy attire, but in this film, our characters are dynamic and have depth, even if they are just children. I truly cannot praise the costume design of this film enough, and it's matched with equally impressive set design and cinematography that greatly serves to immerse you in the story. Everything feels so authentic. The kids speak and act like kids would actually speak and act, which is honestly just such a rarity for movies in general. Even in some of the best films ever made, kids tend to act nothing like kids do in the real world. This is a result of the difficulty in finding competent child actors, as well as screenwriters choosing to write their child characters as one note, with their only purpose being to serve the story. Because of the extreme complexity of children and their range of emotions, it can be very difficult to realistically portray them in fictional stories that typically need to stick to a single consistent tone. Fortunately, Bridge to Terabithia is a passion project, written by those who wanted to share their real-life experiences and who value the perspectives that children offer. The writing of this film is brilliantly efficient and consistently overflowing with subtle nuances, foreshadowing, and dialogue which serves to convey many different things at once. Let's take, for example, one of the first scenes in the movie. Jess is going through his sketchbook. We see that he is a rather talented artist for someone who is presumably a 6th or 7th grader. He flips the page to find that his younger sister, Maybell, drew in his sketchbook. However, the drawing is not just some doodle of no consequence. It's a drawing of her older brother with a crown, showing that she looks up to him and foreshadowing the role he'll play at the end of the film. Jess becomes enraged and yells at Maybell. Their father steps in and offers Maybell comfort, immediately taking her aside. She embraces him with a hug, and Jess's body language tightens up. He becomes closed off and quiet, and the camera is positioned in a way to show how small and fearful he feels in his father's presence. His father looks at Jess's sketchbooks and makes no comment on his art, seemingly unimpressed. Instead, he asked how today's foot race went at school, showing he would prefer that his son assume a more traditional masculine role in society. Mabel answers the question, saying how the new girl beat all the boys at school. So now the scene is even helping to characterize Leslie, a character who isn't even on screen, showing that she is perceived to be a tomboy. All their father says is, make sure you finish your chores, as he hands Jess back his notebook. God, what a fucking brilliant scene. Such a realistic depiction of the subtle abuse children often receive from their parents. The emotional withholding, the favoritism, the pressure to fill preconceived gender roles, the requirement to earn affection and love. If this movie wanted to be brash and obvious, we would just get a scene of Jess's father yelling at him, your disappointment, and physically abusing his son. This is why the film, in my opinion, is so fucking good. It succeeds over and over at its hyper-realistic representation of the type of abuse millions of kids have endured, without needing to stoop to cliches and shock tactics. This scene is just one of many similarly dynamic portrayals that fill this movie from start to finish. Now, this does create one major issue, however, that being that taking a more subtle, restricted approach makes this the type of film I would say is only really fully appreciated by adults. Nothing is made too apparent or obvious and instead requires the viewer put the pieces together in their head as they are led through the narrative. I watched this movie as a kid when it came out, and despite being maybe the most relatable film I would ever see as a kid, I hated it. I just didn't get it. The complex themes, like illustrating the cycle of abuse, went straight over my head. And I thought the film was boring. I mean, literally, you cannot make a film more relatable to a middle school era Newt Grundy, but kids do not want to watch movies that realistically portray their own lives. They want to be swept up in a way in exciting adventures. Also, just because I was experiencing similar abuse and hardships 
doesn't mean I was fully aware of the context of my situation and able to process my abuse in a healthy way. Instead, as a child, I was emotionally closed off and would react inappropriately when movies like Bridge to Terabithia tried to point out the reality of my situation and make me feel less desirable emotions like sadness and grief. So even though I was absolutely the ideal demographic for this film, I hated it. I wish the film would have worked on me and helped me to realize how I was continuing the cycle of abuse and victimizing others around me because of the abuse I had suffered. It surely would have saved me a hell of a lot of heartache throughout the years, but these messages were just too complex and difficult for my young brain to understand. All I knew is that I wanted fantasy action, and Terabithia failed to deliver, so I thought it to be a cruel trick. I came in expecting Lord of the Rings, and instead got chicken noodle soup for the soul, and was pissed. I grew up hating this movie, until I finally watched it again as a self-aware adult. I mentioned the cycle of abuse, and that's what I would state to be the film's most consistent theme. We see time and time again how the emotional neglect and abuse Jess suffers from his dad directly affects his relationship with his younger sister, Mabel. Mabel looks up to Jess, idolizes him, and so badly wants to spend time with Jess and earn his approval. Jess fails to see the vast similarities with this dynamic and the relationship he has with his father, and instead because he resents Mabel for the way their father treats her differently, he chooses to abuse Mabel acting cruelly towards her, and never giving her the time of day. Because the scenes are written with such stark realism and portrayed by child actors who are more than just competent, these scenes can honestly be really hard to watch, but are necessary for the final resolution of the film, when Jess finally realizes what he's been doing, has a change of heart, and decides to treat Mabel with the love she's been craving. It's such a powerful and poignant message, and really makes me love this movie. It's an important message, perfectly conveyed, do not watch this movie with anyone you are not comfortable crying around, because it's fucking impossible not to cry at this thing, dude. Like seriously, even my second viewing, after watching it only a week prior, I still cried multiple times during the third act. It just does such a great job at strongly building all its themes and messages throughout the first three quarters of its runtime, that during its final stretch, every dynamic moment hits harder than the previous one, and I found myself crying at different parts each time. It's a powerful fucking movie, man. These filmmakers are not playing around. They understand the seriousness and importance of the messages they wanted to communicate and forsook no aspect when it came to executing them. Jesus Christ, I've barely talked about the plot. I'm honestly not going to break down the plot to the same level of detail as I've done with previous reviews because I strongly feel you need to just watch this movie yourself. It's an important, timeless story that will benefit anyone who watches it with an open mind. Still though, let's at least sum up what happens. So Leslie and Jess, both being social exiles due to their creativity and unconventional home lives, form a close bond. They discover a rope swing by their houses, which allows them to cross a creek into a heavily forested area, seemingly abandoned and untouched by anyone else. It's here their imagination runs wild, and they name this place Terabithia. Throughout the film's runtime, Leslie and Jess frequently use Terabithia as a means of coping with their stressful lives and processing trauma. For example, the many bullies they face on a daily basis at school are manifested in their creativity as monsters of Terabithia, and it's here they can overcome them and regain a sense of control over their tumultuous lives. Jess and Leslie learn a lot from each other. They push each other intellectually, especially when it comes to Leslie challenging some of Jess's established beliefs. This movie touches on so many serious topics. Jess and Leslie discuss gender roles, their individual differing perceptions of God, and concepts like being damned to hell for eternity when you die. The latter is one of my favorite scenes, when, after Leslie accompanies Jess's family to church, the two friends and Mabel are talking about God in the back of a truck. This scene is really important when it comes to portraying what religious trauma looks like. And I'm honestly really surprised a controversial scene like this made it into the final edit of a Disney film, a company who was known for so long for maintaining the status quo. Jess's artistic prowess is eventually recognized by his musical teacher, portrayed by Zoe Deschanel, and the two form a bond as Jess volunteers to help her with her menial tasks. Again, I'm not going to break down everything that happens, but there is no waste of time in this film. The scenes build upon each other, and the different narrative threads are appropriately reiterated. Like, for example, the bully Janice, who over the course of the film turns from just a villain to a much more complex character and eventually an ally to our main protagonist. This does not happen overnight, 
but rather through a series of different events, making this transformation seem much more plausible. As Leslie and Jess's friendship grows, so does their quality of life. They give each other strength and encouragement, all through the conduit of Terabithian experiences. They become more involved in each other's lives, which opens Jess's mind as he is introduced to new experiences entirely, as well as new perspectives provided by Leslie in regards to his life of tradition and metonymy. Of course, throughout the film, Jess's younger sister Maybelle keeps trying to involve herself and be a part of the special relationship, only to be chastised harshly by Jess, who also continues to desperately seek any chances he has to spend time with his father, who is simply not interested in being there for Jess, and instead favors Maybelle, basking her in affection as Jess watches from the sidelines. Like I said, the music teacher takes notice of not only Jess's artistic skill and reserved temperament, but his lack of financial privilege as well. And because of this, she invites Jess to join her at the museum. It's a Saturday morning where the teacher picks up Jess, and as they drive off, Jess looks at Leslie's house with a sense of hesitancy and uncertainty. When I first saw this part, my stomach sank as I knew what was about to happen, and that Jess would later use the seemingly insignificant decision to later blame himself for the death of his best friend. That's right, death. After returning from the museum, all hell has broken loose back home. Jess's parents tell him that Leslie has died. The rope swing to Terabithia broke, and Leslie hit her head, drowning in the creek. This, of course, is the turning point in the film, where Jess's life is completely unraveled. Now we have to watch Jess, a young boy, go through the several stages of grief and cope with the effects of Leslie's death. I gotta say, it's a thoroughly realistic portrayal of grief, and it's very depressing watching a young boy go through this, especially since Josh Hutcherson's acting really sells every moment. This isn't pointlessly sad cinema simply for the sake of feeling shitty. Leslie's death ends up being a transformative force in Jess's life, that helps him realize his part in the cycle of abuse, and empowers him to stop the cycle, becoming a better person. Leslie's death also works as a catalyst to bring together Jess and his father, finally breaking down the emotional and even physical barriers between them. It even changes Jess's perspective on his teachers and his peers around him. The entire fucking point of Bridge to Terabithia is not to make you feel like total shit because of the death of this sweet little girl. Rather, it's a story of how you should cope with death, how you can continue to love the deceased by continuing to love those who are still alive. How you can honor their memories and what you can do to make your grief bearable enough to want to keep on living. It's a story about the disastrous effects of child abuse, specifically the most convert subtle types of abuse such as neglect, emotional withholding, financial abuse, religious trauma, and secondary trauma. It's a cautionary tale as well as an ode to the love of life, nature, spirit, and human creativity. So you're probably thinking, well, you obviously love this movie, so 5 out of 5 stars, right? Perfect score? And unfortunately, that is not the case. I must be honest and fair and discuss what I dislike about this film. Let's talk music. The original chamber score composed by Aaron Zygmunt, it's great. It's definitely better than average, creating some memorable melodies and reprising its various themes to great effect, emphasizing everything it needs to throughout the film. The issue that I have is the typical Disney method applied to use pop songs made by their young up-and-comers like Miley Cyrus and Hayden Payton Deer. Holy shit, these songs are total fucking garbage, and immediately pull me out out of any established immersion the film has worked so hard to build up into that point. I don't even feel bad saying these songs are trash, because they aren't even real art. Like they are hyper-produced, methodical cash grabs, ghost written by dozens of seedy adults who manipulate young kids, promising them the world so they can solicit their young voices, like fucking Ursula from Little Mermaid. These songs use the most obnoxious vocal stylizations and sound engineering techniques possible. It's on par with such shameful genres such as stadium country or soft Christian rock. It's disingenuine, artificial, and truly annoying to listen to. The worst offender is the song which comes in right as the credits roll. Each time watching this, my face is filled with tears as it's the very end of the film. Every feeling the movie has worked to create, all working together in one final climax, and then I become truly upset and angry when the beautiful moment is completely spoiled by some bullshit Miley Cyrus audio abomination. Both times I had to just quickly shut the movie off and was robbed of a chance to revel in the world and its feelings for a last contemplative moment, which is typically the type of experience credits can offer. A nice come down from the intense emotions. 
but instead they just couldn't resist some bullshit cross promotion and had to use the worst audio stings possible. What's also upsetting is it's just tone deaf and doesn't really make sense with the film's demographic. The film stars a young boy, and these are absolutely not the type of songs a young boy would ever allow themselves to enjoy. Neither are they the type of songs an adult has any interest in listening to either. So who is this for? God, such an awful decision. It happens at least twice in this movie, usually overlaying some cheesy montage, which the film absolutely does not need. And these shameful exercises in filmmaking really bring down what is otherwise a perfect cinematic experience. There's also a fair amount of diegetic music in the score, created by the classroom of singing kids or someone turning a radio on or something. I like the use of these, especially the former. Although, overall, I think the film would have just benefited more from relying more on the original score and not being so varied in its musical choices. Another significant criticism I have is the art design of the fantastical creatures. Some of them aren't bad, like the design of the troll or the Terabithian insect warriors, but for the most part, I find the style to be very off-putting and just not appropriate for the context of the film. Like, these are supposed to come from primarily, if not entirely, from Jess's imagination, as the film is being told from his perspective. Where are the warriors with big suits of armor and cool-looking swords? Where is the edge? Instead of edge, we get awkwardness, like the design of the Skrogers with their weird hats. It's just not cool. It's a weird choice that feels more carelessly random than something created out of inspiration. This awkwardness really comes to a climax during the final scene of the entire movie, where we are introduced to a bevy of different creatures. And oh my god, these designs would look far more appropriate in Neil Gaiman's Sandman than they do here. I mean, come on, they are downright scary. Like the weird, lanky humanoids that have caged birds for torsos, and the 2007 CGI poorly used to mimic human-esque facial expressions creates an unsettling feeling of Uncanny Valley. It's another glaring flaw, which greatly distracts from a final scene that is otherwise incredibly powerful and moving. So because of these flaws, I'm giving Bridge to Terabithia 4 out of 5 stars. It does not receive a perfect score, but is still regardless the current highest rated film I've covered thus far. So it goes without saying that I strongly recommend you watch this movie. I would characterize this film as important, something you need to see, as opposed to something you might just want to see to have a good time. Just don't be surprised when you bawl your eyes out like I did. In fact, I recommend you embrace the cathartic release of emotion. Embrace Bridge to Terabithia and everything it has to offer. If you enjoyed this video, please give the video a like. Feel free to comment below any thoughts you want to share about this week's film, or maybe a suggestion for a film you'd like to see me review in the future. For the time being, I'm going to be sticking to the current trend I've established, which is to say reviewing live-action family fantasies all made in the same brief time period of 2005 to 2010. There was an explosion of these types of Narnia-esque films, and I'm deeply fascinated by this brief creative cinematic movement. Next week, I'll be covering Secrets of Moonacre, which was actually the film Gabor Chupo directed immediately after releasing Bridge to Terabithia. I also really want to review Star Wars The Acolyte, and maybe some other TV shows as well. But these are obviously a bit more of an undertaking. At some point in the next few months, I will also be debuting my short film Stray, I made it completely all by myself, and am immensely proud of the final result. I'm currently just working on painting the title cards. All of this is happening, of course, while I'm undergoing treatment in a residential facility, and I'm trying to find a job. So do me a favor, and while you're smashing that like button, send me some positive vibes. I promise I'll return the favor by consistently turning out some quality content. I'm Newt Grundy, Jeremy Irons is a goddamn smoke show, and I'll see you next week. Bye! Bye.